Good evening. First off, thanks Max for inviting me, for all of you guys for coming out tonight. This is an uh, honor to be doing this. So tonight, just kind of want to share a little bit of my background and career path to this point um, through school and, and professionally. And then uh, after I've got some stuff thrown on the table and we could have a little bit of a Q&A, so uh, save your questions to the end. Um, so a little bit about me. I grew up locally here in Anaheim nearby. Uh, my design story is probably pretty similar to a lot of people here. Growing up, um, athletic kid, I did judo and baseball. Uh, it was probably like my two first sports. Uh, but I wasn't really that into them when I did them. And it wasn't until I started playing like hockey and golf that I got more involved into sports. And it wasn't necessarily because of the sport, but it was because of the equipment. Like in judo, you just get the same gi that everybody else has. Baseball, it's glove, bat, not much. Maybe catcher, like I always wanted to be catcher because you got chest protector, mask, like all this cool equipment. So it wasn't until I started playing like hockey, you have all this protective equipment, helmets and like skates, there's so many details on there. Um, this is what really like caught my interest. So even from an early age, I think started to develop that eye for design or you know that drive towards it even though I didn't really know what it was at the time um, so you know fast forward a little bit and I was really lucky when I was probably like junior high age um, I had a cousin who graduated from the program here who's an industrial designer um, designed skate shoes and has like uh, junior high age skateboarder, like hanging out with pro skateboarders all day, getting free shoes, getting paid to do it. Like that was the coolest job ever. Uh, and he just walked into the door right now. So <laughs> good timing, Kelly. <laughs> um, so Kelly introduced me to design. Uh, he's been one of the biggest influences on my career um, in, in design to this point. Uh, so from that early age, like he brought me into the office, showed me kind of design process and um, what went into designing shoes. Unfortunately, I think at that time I was more caught up in the fact that there's a skate park in the warehouse, a basketball court down there, and mountains of free skate shoes to grab from. So kind of got a little lost there. Um, but when it came time to apply to colleges, you know, I knew that I wanted to do something with product and making things. But for me, I decided to apply as a mechanical engineering student, which I think is another pretty similar path to a lot of people, thinking of taking that engineering route to get to making product. Um, so that was going to be my career path, my, you know, what I was going to do in college, except I didn't quite make up my mind. And I was a little delusional and thought I could be a pro golfer at that time, too. So. I went to junior college and quickly learned that I didn't have the skills and talent to do that and um, focused back on the mechanical engineering. But, you know, sitting in a couple classes doing that, I realized I didn't have the drive for that either. And I was pretty lost, um, even considered like optometry. I was a doctor that didn't have to deal with blood too much. So that sounded pretty cool too. Um, but it was towards kind of the end of this, like my time at community college when I rediscovered industrial design. Um, I don't remember how, but just remembered it and remembered Long Beach State and the program here um, and what Kelly went through and uh, applied and got in. And I think it was after I was talking to him and uh, he kind of told me how he thought it was something that I would be interested in, but didn't really want to push me towards it. So I was really thankful to hear that and uh, pursued industrial design after that. Um, now, I wish I could tell you, like, after that, it was just easy sailing, come here, four years. I don't think anybody graduates in four years, but become a professional and move on, right? But it didn't quite go that way for me. Um, it's kind of embarrassing, but I took the 120B class. I think you guys still have that here, like, at least four times. 
uh, failed it a couple times, would like sign up, do two weeks, drop it, forget to drop it, fail it. Did the same thing in drafting class. So, you know, the university has a nice way of telling you you need to get your act together. So about two years in, I got a nice letter in the mail saying I was on academic probation. And if I didn't raise my GPA, I would be gone. So it was a pretty good motivation to uh, take this a little more seriously. Um, and from that point on, I kind of uh, toughed it out through those early times and really fell in love with design. Um, you know, I went from the guy who was sleeping in the parking lot in his car instead of going to class to somebody who was sleeping in the building here every night uh, just to do more projects and stuff like that. Uh, so you know, during my time here at school, I think I did some pretty similar projects to what you guys are still doing here. Um, really developed my kind of technical skills and um, enjoyed my time here. And at the end of it, seven years later, I graduated. So 10 years total, which isn't quite exactly the standard for a bachelor's degree. Um, something I was pretty embarrassed of for a long time, but oh, I got loud. Um, but you know, it's something that I am a little glad that I did too. Um, I don't necessarily believe like everything happens for a reason, but things happen and they happen. Um, so I couldn't change the past, but as designers especially, uh, all our technical skills in this room are pretty similar, right? Like we can all sketch, we can all do SolidWorks and KeyShot and all those things. Um, but what I think really separates us and separates you from your fellow designers or your experiences, your life experiences, um, it really changes your perception of things and your narrative. So when you do design, it gives you a little bit of a unique voice and uh, you see things from a different perspective than a lot of other people. So although it's not my proudest moment graduating in 10 years, um, I think it didn't really hold me back as I did move forward uh, and enter the design world professionally. So when I did enter, um, into more of my career. I got my first internship at Carl Muller Design uh, down here in Seal Beach. Um, I was pretty naive in junior year. I needed some credits and went up to the furniture design teacher and just said, hey, I want an internship, thinking he would just hand me one. Um, it didn't work out quite that way. He didn't need the help, but he did say he had a friend. And uh, I was really fortunate in that he needed help it was close by, I was doing furniture. I thought I wanted to be a furniture designer. Uh, and Carl taught me about furniture assembly. And, you know, I did a lot of 3D modeling, a lot of uh, renderings for him. Um, but the biggest thing that I took away from him was I did a ton of technical drawings for him. So the five failed attempts at AutoCAD, I got pretty good at it towards the end. So this became my career. And you know, I remember thinking in school, like, who still does AutoCAD? You know, this is like 2010, maybe. Uh, but I did. Like, this is my living. So you know, creating these technical drawings that we could send off to factories to help make prototypes and things like that, this was like most of my work. Uh, but what Carl really instilled in me was these drawings are part of design too, and that like they needed to be designed and you need to be very careful with everything you do. Uh, people need to interpret these. So lining up your leaders, making sure that all your callouts are right, you're layering things properly, using the proper like line weights, all these things. Um, it's something that I still kind of judge other designers by today, if they have sloppy tech packs and stuff, you know, jump ahead a little bit, like at, in case we have uh, some design principles, and one of them is output is everything. It doesn't matter like how big or small it is that you're doing, it has an effect on the brand and has effect on you. So you need to do everything with the same amount of effort and kind of drive or else it's going to show back on you. Um, and it's something that Carl taught me pretty early on and then was later reinforced uh, in my career now. So after working for Carl doing um, 
furniture design for a little bit, you know, I realized I needed a change. Um, furniture wasn't for me. And I think during an internship kind of phase, this is a good time to explore a lot of things. So with Carl, we sat side by side, just, just us two, eight hours a day in his little studio. And it was nice, but at the same time, like pretty boring. Like I missed being in school with friends and Carl's like 40 years older than me. Uh, so, you know, another series of good fortune. One of my really good friends was an intern at Incipio. I had no clue what Incipio was at the time besides the fact that he worked there. Um, but he got the chance to go to Paris to study abroad for a semester, so he was leaving. He told me they had free lunch, free breakfast, a bunch of snacks. Everybody was young, so it was like perfect, right? Um, so I ended up applying and uh, applying was like me talking to the design director at a going away party over some drinks and so I'd come in for an interview. I interviewed with him and my best friend, so <laughs> it wasn't exactly a tough interview there. Um, but at Incipio, um, what I did find out, you know, when I got there is they did a lot of cell phone cases. That's kind of the main focus. All kinds of mobile tech accessories, but traditional injection molding. Um, and the biggest thing for me was with Carl doing furniture, I mean, up until a couple of years ago, I saw new stuff coming out that I was working on five years ago. Like furniture industry can move really slow at times, most of the time. This is something I designed as an intern. By the time I graduated, six months later, it was on shelves being sold. Um, so it's not like my favorite thing I ever designed, but it's something that kind of I hold dear to me because I got to work on it. And to be honest, all I designed was this stupid little black line that goes across there. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I did 20 vision, or like revisions of it, just trying to get that thing perfect. Um, I don't, I don't know if it is, but uh, it's something that still holds pretty dear to me. So, you know, at Incipio, I did some cases, a lot of cases. Um, and although like the, the work wasn't the most fun at time, just designing all these cases, these like drawing bars of soap really, right? Um, the one thing that I did take away from it was, you know, working in this team environment, uh, another thing to note is Incipio, if you guys don't know, it's like third year of studio for Long Beach State. At our height, we had nine designers from Long Beach. We were all friends. We all knew each other. We all went through the same things. It's like a nerdy design frat house over there. Um, but seeing how everybody works and works together, um, one of the other big influences on our career was uh, my best friends, Peter, and just seeing how he worked and how good he was, like every single day, just killing it. Didn't matter how tight the timeline was, never complaining, just doing it. Um, and it's somebody that just really pushed me to be better. Uh, and I knew he didn't want to do cell phone cases, and I didn't either, but it didn't stop him, and he, he just kept crushing it. So, oops. Um, something that I really took from there, and, with you know, with Incipio and with these like cell phone cases, just learning that there's more to get than just these projects from it. Um, what else can you learn from being there? Jeez, oh, it's not going back. There it goes. Um, and there was some diversity. Got to do this weird notification device. It was like early iWatch kind of thing, but or Apple Watch, but a lot less functional, um, some audio things. So there was diversity. And from these like little projects, we got to learn other things, you know, working with elastic bands uh, is kind of a step into soft goods or, you know, the fabrics around the ear cups. So it wasn't taking everything just for face value, but where can this lead me to? What's the next step? Um, and I got a huge opportunity about a year and a half in we had a soft goods designer who didn't do any soft goods, and we got this men's surfwear brand called Tavik, and they had some bags that needed redesigning and developing. 
Um, so I wanted to learn bag design. Like, I've always been into bags, and it seemed like a cool place to, to move my career to. So I asked them to help me out. And for the next year, basically, uh, we worked on these three bags. There's some like flat renderings uh, we did. But it was a crash course of every day, just studying, learning bags, how to tech pack them out. And again, like this training from Carl doing furniture translated over the failed AutoCAD, you know, it kept popping up. All these lessons, these experiences. Um, and I just dove into it and did it every single day, spent like my free time taking apart bags, just trying to learn as much as I could about this. Uh, and the guy who was helping me out, he noticed it. And you know, when, when you get excited about things and you really put the effort in, people notice and he wanted to help out. So he was right there with me, teaching me about all these other things, filling in the gaps that I needed help with. Um, and it really helped me out. Uh, went to China like three or four times, sat in the factories, uh, you know, marking up bags, trying to figure out fit. It was a really fun, like, just crash course in, in bag design for a year. And what we ended up with was this set line, which, again, it's not my favorite bag I've ever worked on, but it's still the thing that I designed that I see the most in the real world. I think it just went out of production this year, so we sold it for a little over three years, and airports on the street randomly, they've only made one line of bags in their lifetime, at Tavik, and I see it more than in Incase, which has a 20 plus year of uh, history. So it was kind of a fun project that I always remember uh, pretty fondly because it, it did give me that step into the bag world. And again, it, who would have thought like designing cell phone cases that this would be the next step, right? But just building those skills and translating them over. Um, so shortly after these bags came out. Um, I got in, uh, called into the kitchen for an all hands on meeting. We had no clue what it was, but everybody in the company at Incipio gets called into the kitchen. And like, we have a huge announcement. And the announcement was that Incipio inquired in case. And I remember the whole design team's jaws just dropped. And we're like, no way. Did they really say in case? Like, that was all of our dreams, like working in mobile tech. This is where we wanted to be, but one, we like never thought we were good enough to go there. Or two, we thought we would get fired if we even like searched in case on our computers because it was the rival. Um, but everything changed that day uh, when they made the announcement. Um, so that happened, but I was still a cell phone case designer really at that point. And I was getting pretty good at it and not, this is like my best work, but we were doing a lot of like women's fashion stuff. So this one isn't too bad, but doing some really weird stuff like adding tassels on to uh, cell phone cases. So this is what we were doing. And then down the street, this is what the other guys were doing. I didn't want to do this anymore. Like, this is what I wanted to be doing. So, you know, again, I, I leveraged my experiences doing the bag lines with Tavik, um, just making it known in the company that this is where I wanted to be. And I didn't want to step on anybody's toes and force my way in, but when a job posting, you know, went up that Incase was looking for a soft goods designer, like that was my chance. You know, I think I had to go through creative director at Incase, head of design, GM, VP of product, and then our CEO. I had to get approvals from all of them. And then my current boss, and I got five out of six. So I decided not to ask for my boss's permission. And uh, the CEO's decision kind of trumps all. So I was able to join Incase in July of 2016. Yeah. So almost three years, or a little over three years with them now. Um, and, you know, going from, I was just talking to Max about this, and like going from a company like Incipio, that's whole model is first to market. 
Um, it's all about quantity, right? How many units can you move? Just trying to make those big sales in the beginning as soon as a new phone launches, whatever. They, if there's a phone out there, they're gonna cover it with a case. Um, they weren't too picky, but then going to a company like Incase that has such a strong uh, design DNA and they hold design to such a high level that if a product is gonna be delayed a little bit, like it's okay because we aren't gonna release something unless it's perfect. That was a huge change, right? And um, I felt pretty intimidated going over there, to be honest, like to step into that and have this team full of designers that nobody was from Long Beach for one, so my safety net was gone. Uh, we, we had a guy from Iran, another girl from or Indonesia, um, a guy from Detroit, like the team was so diverse and their backgrounds were so strong. Like I just remember coming in and feeling so out of place. But the one thing I knew, even if I wasn't as talented as these guys, the one thing I knew I could do was just work harder than them. So that was like my plan. I got my first project in and, and this is a small sample size of sketches, but I just went crazy and just designed all day and night sketching, trying to figure it out. Um, and going too far, to be honest. Like, this is a little painful for me to put up on the screen, to be honest, like to look at this now. But at the time, like I thought it was great and it's over-designed and there's lines going everywhere on it. But I was just trying to make such an impact coming in uh, because, you know, I felt like I didn't belong there and I needed to prove that. Uh, but luckily, there I had a really good uh, boss who let me kind of spin my wheels and do this and, and just trusted it and let me make my mistakes really. Um, so even when we got into sampling and made our kind of first bags, it was pretty rough. These pictures actually don't look that bad. I mean, the renderings look way worse. Uh, but I took it on a trip and halfway into the trip, I couldn't even wear it anymore. Like the fit was wrong. All these things were off. Uh, but he let me kind of make those mistakes and kind of learn from them. And then over time, we stepped back, you know, went back to sketching and really broke it down and minimized things and figured out the use case and really touched like on all these core design principles, right? Um, and it was okay with stepping back to stage one, right? Getting back to sketching, making these paper mock-ups, uh, and the sketches, it's hard to tell, but I mean, they're a lot more simple. Um, not so many lines, like you can make a lot bigger impact by, by doing less sometimes. So, you know, we regrouped and what we came up with was um, this bag here, which is the all route and I have some samples and later on we can kind of talk and walk through some of the different um, samples over there, but it really taught me a lesson in kind of deed around, like less is more, right? Taking a step back, what's unnecessary, really removing the superfluous, uh, getting it down to its core function and core needs. Uh, but it, if I hadn't gotten that opportunity to go crazy with it and step back, like I, I would have never learned those lessons. So I was really thankful to, to be put through that. Um, and it really kind of shaped my designs from there and made me feel comfortable just being there and being one of the team. So uh, we ended up making a whole family. So there's a roll top and like a day pack here. And again, we have some samples and sketches and, and different things we can kind of talk through later. Um, but, you know, my time there since, uh, I forgot to mention earlier, now I'm the director of soft good design at uh, in case, and it's something that, again, talking to Max, it kind of happened quick and it caught me by surprise and it wasn't a progression that I thought was gonna happen. And, and even being in school, right? Like you get into portfolio and you're feeling like so great about things, right? Your confidence is so high. Then you get in junior studio and they just hammer you down and you feel like you're terrible and you can't do anything. And then you slowly build up and you graduate and just, you know, you're the best, right? Like, 
you're great designers all of a sudden. Uh, you accomplished a lot and you deserve that, but then you go to work and then you're nothing again and you don't know anything. Um, and just that constant cycle of just rising up and getting humbled really quick. I mean, it still happens to me today with every job change or promotion or raise, like it's just, am I worth this? And, you know, finding that trust and, you know, believing in your skills, but that humbling experience is also really good to have because um, it reminds me, it reminds you of kind of where you came from and everything else. So, uh, kind of blew through this really quick, but there's a kind of one closing thing. I uh, talked a lot about like fort being fortunate and having these kind of events in my life that uh, worked out in my favor. And I don't necessarily, again, believe in just like good fortune, good fortune's sake, like um, just because I was introduced to design really early, you know, didn't mean that I was just instantly a designer. Um, you have to work towards it and you have to be ready to accept that good fortune. So, you know, getting in the internship with Carl Muller, like if I hadn't done well in the furniture class, you know, worked really hard and impressed the teacher, then I would have never got that opportunity there. Uh, same going over to Incipio. If I didn't have the technical skills and worked hard in class and built, um, built all that skill and everything, then they still want to offer me, even if it's my best friends there or whatever else, or they wouldn't offer me a job afterwards. Um, going over to Incase, like all these things. Um, yeah, I was very fortunate that Incipio bought Incase, but it wouldn't have meant anything if I was a bad designer. There's five other designers on that team and I was the only one that went over. And it's not that I'm better than them, but things fell into place for me. You know, Soft Goods Designer took me under their wing and I was able to capitalize on that and really build skills and translate them into the next move. Um, so, you know, for those of you out there in internships or maybe working or whatever, it's not looking at just what you're doing right now, but looking at where it can take you and looking at those different steps. Um, changing industries is really tough and can be a daunting task, but it's not impossible. Like finding those little connections. You know, for me, it was a cell phone case company that owned a surfwear company. I did cases for the surfwear company, built the relationship there. When the bags came down the line, I kind of knew a little and I found the resources to help me build off of that and then lead over to here and work a job that when I was a student, like I wouldn't even dreamed of working at any case. Like they didn't teach soft goods here. We didn't, you know, I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't even know they were in Chino Hills. I thought they were in San Francisco, to be honest. So uh, that was a shock too. But um, what it really came down to though is just, there's a lot of opportunities out there, but it's no good if you aren't ready to take them, right? And you aren't prepared to take them. So, you know, for me, it was taking a little longer in school and missing up on, or passing up on some opportunities because I wasn't ready for them. But when the right ones did come along, I was prepared for it and um, was able to end up here. So things worked out kind of all right. <laughs>
you understand, but looking big picture and how these other things overlap into different industries, uh, because there's other people that think that way. Um, you know, Apple's a good example of like, they pull from all different places for their designers. Um, their design team's super small, it's like 20 people, but they have very diverse backgrounds. Some are really art heavy, some come from soft goods, and they all work on the same projects together. So you get some of these like higher level companies and, and that's how they're thinking. They want textile experts on their design team, right? Because they can drive innovation in that area. And you can see things from a new perspective that people who have been doing it for 20 years won't see. So it, it definitely takes some more work and the recruiters might not be like blowing up your email box, but it, it is possible if you take the initiative and you prepare yourself again for you know, what type of questions are gonna come up and what are they looking for and how can you translate those skills. I think the longer you design, the less kind of design work you can, you know, kind of gears towards that path. And especially like with me going from designer to more director position, um, it meant doing less of the day-to-day -day sketching and pinups and things like that. It's more relying on me to get things done that they know they can manufacture. Like the first thing that's brought up in every meeting is what's, what's the cost? What's FCA, what's FO, like what are we looking at and how can you hit these numbers, right, to make these margins? So understanding the business case side of things um, and working cross-functionally with development, sourcing, like who's buying these materials, can we save money there? It's all these other things to work, you know, work out and think about and um, a lot more Excel than like Illustrator these days, for sure. Um, and then on the manufacturing side, yeah, I think like all good designers should have um, experience in development and, and understand like how things are made. Uh, if you're doing injection molded stuff, what does tooling look like? How are the tools made? How's it being injected? Um, just understand that process because you can make things that are easier to make so they'd be cheaper. You can make things that are faster to make, right? So you, again, it's reducing costs, but also reducing uh, waste too, like scrap rates. If you make something that's too hard to make and they're throwing away 10% of it, like that's money lost too. Um, so building those relationships with the manufacturers, going overseas, being in front of, in front of them and working hand in hand uh, is a really important part about this. And so as you do move into the professional world, like trying to get overseas or trying to get to your, your vendors as soon as possible is, is definitely helpful. Um, so I think part of that is just understanding, right, how things are made to save money. Right now, soft goods, for example, we used to be right around 17% tariffs. We're up to 47.6% tariffs now. It's a huge jump, right? Um, so somebody's got to pay for that. Consumers don't want to pay for it. Companies don't want to pay for it. Nobody wants a lesser product either. Right, so getting smarter about how you're designing, um, how you're designing things. So maybe less paneling, like on a bag, less steps to make it, where you aren't sacrificing the user experience and the quality of the bag. Um, also looking into sourcing and being smarter about like the the business side about things, making less but more of it, so you can leverage better pricing with your factories and things like that. Uh, but from a design standpoint, I think it's really understanding what manufacturing uh, goes into manufacturing and all the steps and treating that process as kind of a design project too, right? Using your design thinking to solve these issues and how to do something more efficiently um, or how to do it cheaper without making those sacrifices to quality, uh, which is a lot easier said than done and it's going to be a long process that... Uh, yeah, it's something you need to work towards, but at the same time, like it's not gonna happen overnight. And it's definitely a hard thing. 
ideally um, 14 to 16 months from design kickoff to shipping of production. Um, it's not 14 to 16 months of design, that's for sure. It's all front loaded to so maybe like a month, month and a half of design and then another, if you're lucky, maybe up to 60 days of revisions. So like with the bags over here, there's multiple rounds of having it made, making comments, adjusting, having the next one made, testing it out. Um, but the biggest thing with, with bags compared to like injection molded parts is you have to order material, which they have to weave it, then they have to dye it. And you know, 10,000 yards of that, that's gonna take 40 to 60 days just to get the material. And then to cut it all and sew it and package it up, that's gonna take another 30 to 40 days. Um, and to save money, you should be shipping it by ocean, which takes 30 to 40 days, not shipping it by air. It saves a ton of money, but when you're up against deadlines, you gotta ship it by air and eats into cost again. Um, so it's just really long lead times. Whereas like in plastics, you just pour pellets into the hopper and if your tool's ready, you shoot it and 1,200 pieces a day, 1,500 pieces a day and super easy. Uh, whereas you need 10 people down the line to sew a bag, probably even more than that. When working like overseas vendors, like especially China, so that's mainly who we work with at Incase. Um, one, there's a time difference, 15 to 16 hours, right? So when we're awake, they're asleep. When they're awake, we're asleep. So it's hard to coordinate that. You have these small windows. But anything you do, it's going to be a 24-hour turnaround for the most part uh, on emails, unless you want to stay up all night and, and talk, uh, which I try not to do. Um, but sometimes you have to. The other thing is shipping. So like with soft goods, you can't send like a SOLIDWORKS or a Pro E file, right, back and forth. Um, you need to send a physical sample. So that's gonna take three days to go. Three days for me to get it, then another day for me to make comments, a day for them to receive the comments, another five to seven days to make the next sample. So all of a sudden you're just adding weeks and weeks onto your timeline. Uh, but if I go to the factory and I sit down with their sample maker, I could just pull out a marker, draw all over it, and tell them change this, change that, come back in a couple of days, and it's done. So especially when you're, you know, when we're up against tight deadlines or it's a little trickier to make, it just saves so much time um, to be there in person. And the other thing is just building that relationship. Like, they're people. We're all people. Like to make that connection, to get that trust, and build that friendship, uh, it goes a long way. Um, and especially with the business culture there, there's a lot of manners and a lot of formality um, that I think a lot of companies kind of glaze over at times. Um, it's really you know disrespectful culturally. Uh, so going there, having dinner and a few drinks with them, like it, it goes a long way, and it might mean you'll get your sample a couple days faster, or they'll rush shipment on something or, or whatever else. Sustainability is uh, it's a tough thing right now. So there's a lot of like recycled plastics out there um, that they're or you know recycling plastics, recycled PETs, turning it into polyester. They're recycling nylons out of the ocean. Um, Parley is a good example of that collecting ocean waste, turning it into nylon. Uh, but there's also the other side of logistically. Um, yeah, you're collecting waste and recycling, but to gather something in Costa Rica and ship it to San Francisco to a processing plant to clean it, then to ship it somewhere else in the US to turn it into pellets, then ship it to Asia to make it into yarn, then weave it, like it's a huge carbon footprint, right? And so. That's the one side that it's kind of tough. They don't talk about the full cycle, the full supply chain too often. Um, but it's great that people are making steps in that direction. Um, you know, there's companies like Bionic who collects ocean waste as well. Um, Eastman is a great company that 
they're finding ways to uh, sort plastic and melt it down and break it down to the molecular level so you can get virgin polyesters and virgin nylons. You aren't losing the strength um, and they're able to recycle more. You know, recycling's tough, like with the backpack, there's metal, there's like zinc zipper pullers on there, there's nylon, there's polyester, there's foam inside of there. And you, you can't just, you know, separate it all out. So they're coming up with these compounds that can break down certain elements and, and not others and like liquefy polyesters and things like that. So I think it's getting there, but there still isn't like a perfect solution. But it's great that consumers are so aware of it um, because it is more expensive and it's hard to justify the cost um, when nobody's going to care about it. But now that consumers are paying attention, it's a marketing play. Uh, it, it adds value to it. And I think it's moving in the right direction, but there's still the business side of it and you got to make money. Um, you have to make money to fund these like sustainability efforts and things like that. So. So that, um, I'll speak more from like a brand perspective on this. Um, and it's not something that we'd probably ever publish, but we have design principles, right? Like we have certain things we need to hold to and our company motto is a better experience through good design. So there are natural fibers out there. There's, you can make and weave fibers out of bananas, pineapples, orange peels, like all these things and it's great, but all of our fabrics have to pass certain testing. So tensile strength, warp and weft, abrasion resistance, um, water permeability tests. So we have all these standards to ensure that the bag you buy is gonna last you. Uh, again, we don't print it, but our bags will last you like five years easy, 10 years in most cases. And it's because it's built into the materials. So that also I feel like is a sustainability story, right? Buying less keeping it longer. Um, it's a little harder one to tell for the most part, but you know, we aren't going to put any materials on our bag that we aren't fully testing and we fully back because it's going to be a nightmare later. And if people aren't buying them or returning them, we still made a bunch of waste, even though it's made out of recycled materials. Um, so especially in the <clears throat> bag industry, the natural fibers are tough because they tend to not be as strong. And then, to coat them on top of that, that kind of takes away from that because we're using petrol-based coatings, you know, DWRs, polyurethane coatings and things like that. Um, but they're making advances in those industries too with biodegradable PUs and, and things like that. So um, we're moving towards it. But again, we aren't going to put anything on our products if, if it's not going to perform to our standards. Uh, and that's that's just a, that's more of a brand thing though. YKK is safe. YKK is great, right? Um, but again, it comes down to testing. And if you can ever see a zipper pull test thing, it's the coolest machine. It just goes up and down. It's the most like therapeutic thing. It just keeps <laughs> zipping the zipper up and down between like these two wheels. I wish I had a video of it. It's really cool. Um, if you can't fall asleep, watch that. But you, know, you have to make sure that you're testing all your materials and all your trims and making sure that you know, they aren't getting snagged. And even YKK uh, zippers will get snagged too if you try to make them do something that they aren't trying to do. I think that's the biggest mistake with a lot of bag designers that are trying to manipulate these zippers. Zippers want to go one way, right? They, they want to turn on themselves. They don't want to make like left and right turns. They bind up real easy. I don't care what zipper you're using, it's going to bind up. Um, so understanding how the zipper works and then just making sure you're doing your testing, uh, making sure it's strong enough for the application. You know, if it's like a, that luggage over there, you aren't going to use like a tiny number three zipper on there. That thing's going to pop all day. Uh, but then again, if it's like a little coin purse, you aren't going to use a number 10 chunky zipper that's going to be way overkill and probably can't make the turns either. Um, but yeah, YKK is always safe. Riri makes really good zippers. It, it depends on budgets. So if you don't have the money to 
pay for YKK zippers, there are good zippers out there. You just have to make sure you test them because there's a lot of really bad ones too. Uh, and test a lot of them, not just like one, right? That's what I to ask. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll be upfront, like not all our bags use YKK. We're pushing to change them all over, um, but we still test them. And you know, if there is an issue with one, we make sure we find what batch it came from and, and get down to the bottom of it and be really proactive from that standpoint. Uh, I would say I still don't really know how to sew, to be <laughs> honest. Um, so I guess this is a little bigger question, but um, no, I didn't know how to sew. Like, I think I'd used the sewing machine once in college with Tim back there, and it didn't go very well. Um, but with bags, like, we, uh, where's tech back? For us, uh, because pattern makers are so expensive and hard to come by and bags are so complicated, um, it's easier and cheaper for us to leverage our factory um, pattern makers to do bags. They're amazing. Like, uh, I'll bring out a bag. So I have our icon bag here, which is like our most iconic bag. It's 237 pieces, uh, 270 steps to make the bag. I think I have all the pieces here and I can lay it out. Like it'd be a nightmare. I tried to make a pattern for a shirt one time and that was like four panels and I got confused. So <laughs> um, definitely knowing pattern making and sewing helps and that could cut down your development time if you're good at it. And again, understanding how things are made and construction. Um, but I got my like first real lesson in sewing in a factory. They like they're like show us you can sew. And I had three people yelling at me in Chinese and Mandarin, pulling like the thing five different ways. And those machines go so fast. Like you guys have them here, like those Juki machines. Um, so I've gotten a little bit better. I could sew like sew straight lines, but that's about it. I just stick to this. <laughs> Not in bags. Uh, again, we run a small team too. So uh, at its smallest, sometimes it's one soft goods designer. At its biggest, it's three. Um, and I think I'm working on 60 projects right now at various stages. You know, some are in development and kind of done, and some we're making comments, and some are in design stage. It's just too much. Even our factories who have a full team to just work on samples, they're we chatting me every night like too many samples, like you gotta cut it back. Um, so if you want to like truly like innovate and we have an innovation calendar, it's not every season. It's it kind of gaps out on a lot, lot longer lead times. That's where we'll kind of get in and, and work a little bit more. But um, you know for me it's more of doing this like paper models um, and can scale it up to full size. Uh, there is some software out there. I think it's like Nexus or something makes NX, it's like a 3D software that you can flatten out and make patterns on. I haven't messed with that. There's another one called Optitex, which uh, uh, the clothing industry uses. You can do really cool renderings and stuff and it digitally sews it all together had some training on that but again to do a bag it was just so many panels that I, I just got lost and um, it was tough so usually the furthest I'll take it is to a paper model um, occasionally I'll send the paper model overseas or if I'm at the factory it's just cutting paper grabbing a stapler and just modifying it um, because of speed like usually it's easier to just have them crank out one of these like first round models or first round prototypes, um, change out materials and then start uh, making adjustments from there. How many pieces are on this bag? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't tell you. Like the only reason why we counted the pieces for the other bag is because we were doing a marketing thing and they wanted to know like why we're, our company wanted to know why it was so expensive to make. And we're like, well, it's 200 something steps to make it. Like, cost money to do all those steps. So um, we don't do panel breakdowns, which 
we should, to be honest, um, because then you should be laying it out and figuring out what your yield is off of a roll of fabric, uh, how it nests and everything else. If you really want to save money and be really stringent on it, we trust our factories on that. Uh, we have pretty good relationships though. Um, but what we do look at, we have a build of materials. So they give us a full list of every material used, how much of it is used, not panel by panel, but total, how many pieces are cut from that. Um, every foam, everything on it, and a breakdown of price, how much they're charging for labor, how much they're charging profit, any tariffs, any duties, packaging, all those things. Um, and then that's, that's your either FOB or FCA, depending on how you're shipping it. That's your cost, the actual cost to you, not counting uh, a lot of other factors, but just the, the cost of that product. Um, so that's what we look at a lot more and try to make adjustments there in, in terms of pricing and things like that.